Oh, hello. Fancy seeing you here on a Monday morning, but glad you could join us. Welcome to Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm. Each week, we will be interviewing local, regional, and national business leaders to give you an inside peek into how they lead their businesses to success in an ever-competitive business climate. So pour yourself a hot cup and enjoy the show. Welcome to Inside the Firm's Monday Morning Coffee episode. I'm your host, Alex Gore. I'm here with Patrick McLamey, uh, who worked his way up from a junior designer to CEO at the architecture firm HOK, uh, which is, if you don't know HOK, uh, you're probably not in architecture. <laughs> so, so it's a global architecture, engineering, and planning firm where he's worked for over 50 years. Why I have him on this podcast is he just finished a book, um, designing a world-class architecture firm. And we kind of want to dive into his lessons learned, but also the future struggles, especially the struggles of this time um, and what we can do about it. So Patrick, how's it going? Okay. I'm, I'm doing very well, Alex. Yeah. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. Um, how did you almost move to Colorado? How do you know where Longmont is? <laughs> um, I, I grew up in the Midwest in, in a little industrial town in Illinois on the bank of the Mississippi River, really close to St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, I knew there had to be somewhere better to live than that area because it was, it was flat and featureless. Uh, and the area where I grew up was so dirty, industrial and dirty, that when it, we'd have snow in the, in the winter, the first day the snow would be white, the second day it would be gray, and the yeah. third day it would be darker gray. Um, and uh, I, I, it's a long story, but I basically went to work for HOK right out of college. It's the only job I've ever had since university and was hired by Gio Obata, the O of HOK, uh, who is the design partner and the only one still living. He's 96. And... Um, I didn't really want to go to St. Louis because I had grown up there. I wanted to go somewhere out west. But uh, at the time I graduated, I needed a job. And uh, he was the first person to give me a, a real serious job interview and a, and a good job offer. Um, $750 a month, which I thought was, uh, and again, this is more than 50 years ago. That was pretty good money for that time. So um, I went to work in St. Louis, which was the only office that HOK had at that time. The firm has, it was, had been founded 12 years earlier in 1955. So when I joined in 1967, I realized, uh, Alex, that probably most of your listeners weren't born yet. <laughs> but, uh, if, if they're lucky, they'll get to be... Um, They'll get to have a full long career in architecture and talk to younger people about their experience and help them out, as I hope to do today. So uh, when I got my first vacation, paid vacation from HOK, I decided to go out in my Volkswagen Beetle, which was the, the car of choice for young people in those years. And I wanted to go see the mountains. And uh, I drove to, I didn't, well, I did drive to Denver. But I really, I really ended up close up to the mountains at, at Boulder. Mm -hmm. And I fell in love with Boulder. The mountains were there right above Boulder. It was smack up against the, the, the eastern range of the mountains. The snow was glistening white on the mountaintops. The air was clean. The sky was blue. The water was blue instead of dark brown where I grew up. And I was so thrilled at that environment. I thought, you know, I could live here. I could work here. So I went to the phone booth, one of the public phone booths, and for younger listeners, phone booths used to be everywhere, and they all had big, thick phone books in them with yellow pages. And I found that that was the, the Google of the day. And I found yellow pages for architecture listings and got a list of all the architects in Boulder. And don't tell Ma Bell, but I ripped the yellow pages out of that phone book and took it home with me thinking that I would write to these Boulder architects and um, ask for a job. So uh, I finished my vacation. 
I also visited um, lots of the towns around Boulder, uh, but there's another story behind that that I can tell later. I actually consulted in Boulder for Boulder County for some some period of time uh, uh, as they were doing a justice study to de decide whether or not to build a new jail. This goes back a few years, but I went to a lot of towns in Boulder County and the environment, the, the surrounding area. But anyway, by the time I got to, back to St. Louis, um, I found waiting for me, Gio's secretary saying, we'd like to move you to a new project office in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Now that was moving east instead of west, yeah. but I had been to Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh was a rather pretty town, not the steel town that maybe you still think of it as. It was steel mills had been shut down, the air was clear, and uh, Pittsburgh is hilly and quite mm -hmm. beautiful where the uh, Monongahela and the Allegheny Rivers come together to form the Ohio. And uh, so instead of going to Boulder or going west, I came, I went east to Pittsburgh to a project office where HOK was hooked up with four not one, but four local architects in a joint venture to design new high schools for the Pittsburgh Public School District. And I spent a year in Pittsburgh and actually thought again about, well, maybe I could live in Pittsburgh because Pittsburgh was more exciting and I thought much more dramatic than St. Louis. And uh, toward the end of that one year, my immediate boss, who, who was Bill Valentine, who worked for Gio Obata, as I did, um, came to Pittsburgh to meet me. We, and uh, we, we played racquetball at the local Y almost every time he came. We were real racquetball fanatics in those days. And as we were sitting in the locker room, drenched in sweat after our game, Bill said, Gio has asked me to move to San Francisco. We're starting a little tiny first real permanent branch office in San Francisco. And um, I've been there once. It's going to be very exciting. We actually don't have any California work. I said, well, where's the work coming from? Well, it's, it's in Alaska. The Alaska pipeline was being built, and a flood of oil dollars had flooded into the state, and every town and village in Alaska got money to build things. So the local firm in Anchorage that we discovered was the biggest firm in town, had eight people in, in Anchorage, biggest firm in the state. They were swamped with work and needed help. And we were handy and we needed work. So um, uh, basically that's why we opened a, a brand, the first branch office in San Francisco. So after a year in Pittsburgh, I finally moved west, but I flew right over Boulder and Denver and landed in San Francisco. I had never been west of Boulder until that time. And uh, I fell in love with San Francisco, as probably many people do when they see it. Uh, unlike St. Louis, the buildings there are white. They're not black. The bay is a gorgeous setting for the city. And um, the, the, there were little white sailboats uh, out on the bay that day. I crossed the Golden Gate Bridge to go to Marin County, which is straight north, to look for a place to live got lost and ended up in a, in a redwood grove. I'd never seen a tree so beautiful or so large. And I actually finally made up my mind, okay, this is it. This is where I'm going to live. But it was HOK's first ranch office. And uh, there were four of us that began that work, but we had no California work. So that's another story. How the heck do you break in to a marketplace like San Francisco that had plenty of local competition and where we were thought of as the carpetbagger from St. Louis. Yeah. yeah. So before we go into that, I yeah. got to ask a, a question that I think is maybe on the minds of a lot of listeners. And that's a, every year, let's just say 10,000 architecture, future architects grad, uh, graduate. I don't know if that's the actual right. number, but round number. Right. When you started at HOK, how many people were at HOK? And then when you became CEO, how many people were at HOK? Okay, that's, that's a good question. Thank you. Uh, when I joined, HOK was just one office in St. Louis, Missouri, and there were, it was the biggest office, the biggest firm in the state. Uh, in 12 years, they had grown from 14 when they began work to 150. 
So I was the 151st employee at HOK. And uh, I can explain that you don't normally start a firm with 14 people. You start with one or two, maybe. But HOK was the, was, uh, a, the product of a split of a former firm. Hmm. Um, George Helmuth, the H of HOK, who was a marketing genius, had uh, started a firm seven years before with uh, a Japanese-American architect from Detroit Minoru Yamasaki, who is probably best known for his design of the World Trade Center. Mm-hmm. This was long before the World Trade Center, but Helmuth persuades, persuaded Yamasaki, who we always called Yama, and another person in a firm uh, called Smith Henchman and Grills. They were all working in Detroit, persuaded them to break away and form their own firm, and that Helmuth would be their marketer. He would be the one getting work which was a revolutionary idea. Uh, and that firm was, uh, that firm lasted for six years. And Helmuth wanted to establish a branch office in St. Louis, where he was from. And so Helmuth flew back and forth between the two cities and found, he found more work in St. Louis than he did in Detroit. And Yamasaki got tired of flying back and forth. Uh, plus he had, uh, he had ulcers, so he wasn't in great health. And he finally said to Helmuth, why don't we just close up St. Louis and you come back and live and work in Detroit and uh, market for me. And Helmuth did not like that. So he, uh, Helmuth, uh, this was during a lunch in St. Louis. And after lunch, Helmuth went into the drafting room in Helmuth Yamasaki and Lineweber, it was called, and picked out the two people. The top assistant for Yama was another Japanese-American architect, Gio Obata, and the other one was George Kassebaum, mm. who was the assistant to Lineweber for production. So he said, uh, he, he asked them if they would like to form their own firm and basically take over the St. Louis office. And um, uh, they said yes. The Helma said it, the entire conversation took two minutes. So then he called Yama back and said, why don't we split our firm on friendly grounds? I'll take the St. Louis office. Yama, you can have the Detroit office, and I'll take the work that's already in existence here, and you can take the work that's already in existence in Detroit. So Yama stayed in Detroit with Lineweber, who was his production architect, and Helmuth formed HOK in St. Louis with a staff of 14 uh, with a a ready backlog of work. which was lucky, but it's always nice if you're going to start something and have a little cash flow already. Uh, so that firm had been built from 14 to 150 by the time I came in 1967, 12 years later. When I became CEO, the firm was 1,800 people. That was in 2003. So that was uh, uh, 40-some years later. So and it's a the crux of my question then is how did you go about standing out in you already have 150 people and you probably had classmates that you know were talented a lot of people are talented dedicated hardworking. did you see certain decisions that you were making was it strategic was it just hey i'm just good at my work and it just this falls in my lap could you kind of explain that process because some people Uh, do have these ambitions and i don't know if they directly know how to go about it. In other words, how do you stand out in a large firm? Yes. How do you stand out, stand out in a crowd? Um, Well, the firm has, um, I'll I'll describe it this way. The firm has a Midwestern culture uh, where work hard, keep your head down, keep your nose clean and work hard and you will be noticed. And that suited me to a T. I was built for, uh, for working. And uh, uh, I was noticed, and, and again, with 150 people, um, the other thing about a firm of that size is there are pieces of the firm. If you want to be a standout designer, you can, that's a very small group of people. If you want to be a standout project manager, that's another somewhat larger, but not too big. If you want to be a project architect, that's another group. And I was a designer at that time. And uh, I think of all the things that I did that impressed uh, Gio and Bill Valentine, who 
was the senior designer in charge of my project, is I built models until there were no more models to make. I made models at my desk for anything that Bill and Gio were designing. I made models at, we had a model shop across the street uh, with, uh, we made models with a new material for me then, which was foam. Mm -hmm. And uh, we cut the foam and put it together with T pins. Uh, and I managed not to cut my finger off, fingers off doing that. But I made models um, day and night. And uh, when I made the models, and he always said this, said there's a, there's a hand-eye connection uh, that's hardwired into the human brain. And if you make a model of a building with your hands, you, can, you will understand the building better than if you simply draw it by hand, or much better than if you simply punch it out in a computer. So as I made these models, I was able to see things, gain insights about the building that I would bring up to Bill and then to Gio and say, you know, this doesn't work so well. What if we tried this? But it was, I wasn't trying hard. I was just trying to solve the problem of the building, these great high schools in Pittsburgh. And um, uh, I became known for um, working at a problem until I had it figured out. And I think I became known for hard work and diligence, basic traits. Uh, I wasn't a standout um, craftsman. I couldn't draw. I could draw pretty well, but not. Uh, there were people in the office that certainly drew better than I. But I became known as, I think, reliable at that point in a young person's career. If you don't know everything, make yourself reliable. Make yourself useful. Yep. And I think that was the path I took. I think there's a key there that I just want to highlight working at a project till you fill it out, figure it out. There's a lot of complexity in this world and bosses or managers can't really sometimes don't have the time to focus, to figure out all the details. So if you can be part of that solution and not just yeah. part of the problem, I, I think that's a key skill set. Well, let me tell you all this. I don't think it's a secret, but it, it seems like a secret. We think that our bosses our leaders, our principals, our partners are going to solve all these things. But actually, we're not working for them. They're actually working for us. The leaders of a, of a really good firm are on the bottom of the organizational uh, uh, diagram, helping bring the work in and getting the people organized to do the work. And certainly they give direction, but most of the work is getting done by people who are younger, um, and who are learning as they go. And the, uh, there isn't enough time in the day for a busy partner or principal to dig in and solve every problem on a project. And that's why I always say architecture is a team sport. Mm -hmm. And if you cultivate an attitude in your own firm that good ideas can come from anyone, including the person that makes the coffee, then you're going to have a more successful firm. Yep. Um, let's talk about, I, I think there is a difference between leading and management and you kind of hinted at that, but I've worked at, I don't know, larger firms and smaller firms. And I kind of want to dive into if HOK manages any different than maybe anyone else. And this is kind of, you know, this wasn't on the list of topics, but I'm, I'm sure you can, can speak to it. Meaning yeah. at both the big firms and the small firms, it was sort of an ad hoc management system. You put a group together, you, someone makes up almost arbitrarily a due date, and then you work towards that goal and you assess from there. Yes. Is, is, yes. is that what HOK does? Is there something different? Is it that kind of style? Um, yes. Well, uh, HOK was always, uh, from the very beginning, HOK always assembled the pro the, uh, the the, for each project or each, Helmuth called them jobs. If you get a job, who's going who's gonna to design, who's going to manage, and who's going to be the project architect? And those were three skill sets that they felt had to be interwoven for the success of any project. The project designer, uh, his or her job was to develop the proper design solution and, and uh, carry it through all the way through not only design, but the project designer stayed on the job, probably not full-time, but part-time through 
DD, and then gradually less time in, in uh, construction documents, but still engaged because there are design decisions all the way through. Gio um, always said, design is not a phase, design is a process. So the project designer has an overall responsibility for design and design does not stop after bidding. Design continues in construction and the designer needs to go to the site and work with the contractor and the subs and make sure that the building as it's being put together has the right answers and has the right, the right finishes and the right colors and so on. So there's, and even after the project is finished, a good designer, and this was drilled into us, a good designer will visit the, the client after the building is punched out and finished and delivered to the client and do a walkthrough with the client and with a clipboard and hear what the client has to say. This works, this doesn't work as well. This was a pleasant surprise. This was an unpleasant surprise. And take all of that as learning experience and also incidentally get much more bonded to the client, which, you know, if architects, if, if there's one thing I could say to young people out there that are starting their own firms or that have their own firms, if you are not sincerely interested in your clients, if you're not more interested in them than in yourself, you're not going to be successful. Clients are what, there are a reason for existence. We are, of course, interested in doing great design and becoming the next Frank Lloyd Wright or Frank Gehry or whoever, but if you're not sincerely interested in your client, you won't succeed. So I've taken a roundabout way. I've talked a lot about design here, but project management. The project manager at HOK was always assigned the, um, as soon as we had a project under contract. And the project manager's job at HOK was basically scope, schedule, and budget to make sure that that project was, was designed and delivered on time and within our budget, our design budget, and the client's budget, both. And that's a that's a lot of juggling to do. And then finally, the project architect. And the project architect was brought in at the beginning and usually didn't have as much to do, but began to advise on the uh, the constructability, the detail. Um, if there were if the designer was doing something that caused a, uh, a difficulty with detailing out the building, maybe it was going to leak because of the way something was done. It was the project architect's job to call that out to the designer. And if the three did not work harmoniously, then the building uh, didn't have a good future. So at HOK, we always had three leaders assigned for every project. They weren't all three all full-time all the time, but they were from start to finish. So that's the way it worked at HOK. And I just, I want to say one other thing about leading versus managing. We have a lot of titles in our profession. Project manager is something. I was a project manager for quite a few years and um, maybe a managing principal after that. What's that word management? What does it mean? When I was a young architect at HOK, I thought, okay, managers, they're the ones that get to have an office. And you, with, a, with, a, and you, with a desk and chair. And a so window, on. maybe. Maybe a window. And the managers are the ones that get to tell people what to do. And so if I get to be a manager, I'll get my own office and I get, people will come in and ask me what to do and I'll tell them and they'll go out and do it and that will be it. <laughs> <laughs> and I found out, of course, that that's not leading, that's managing. And if you do that, if you, if you make yourself into a manager where you're simply giving instructions, detailed instructions to people, they will do their best to carry them out but they won't put their own imagination or their own learning into it. And what they need is a leader, not a manager. They need someone that's out there in the trenches with them. The best example is the second and first lieutenants in the army that lead the troops mm -hmm. into battle. They're not in the back lines. They're not a backbencher. Um, so get out of that office if you have one and get with your people. And in fact, at HOK, project managers did not have offices. Um, and the, the people that had the windows with the view were the, in those days before computers, were the draftsmen. The, the officers had uh, three-sided cubicles 
up against the core of the of the office, the where the elevators were. So they got the light too, but not the best views. Best views were the people that were lower down the totem pole. And I think all those are little subtle things, but leading instead of managing means you're engaged with your people. You're asking them lots of questions. You're giving them suggestions for how they might try something, but giving them the room to learn and grow. And young people like myself thrive in that kind of circumstance when someone gives me the opportunity to explore and learn um, and grow. So leading is different and it's the essential ingredient in any, I think any project team or in any uh, office or any firm leading instead of managing. Yeah. I, I, I love that concept and I, and I love the, the three leaders essentially for, for one project. Uh, Lance and I also a lot of times advocate that every firm should have at least two leaders and, in the tech industry, when you go for funding, you need, you know, at least two, but yeah. Yeah, I can see how three would work just as well. Yes. Help me uh, understand now. Okay. So you have those three leaders. And one of the things that you recommend is having a leader to, uh, you know, basically on full-time marketing to win new yes. work and yes. new projects. And let me lay out maybe the, the problems and, and I'm sure you've solved this. So <laughs> let's say, let's say I'm, I'm, uh, let's say I'm that person. And, and I'm going to, you know, get, let's just say it's a four story project mixed use with parking garage and, and things like that. I'm convincing the client almost with my experience, my know-how, the, um, knowing about fire code, uh, being able to talk about cost savings of what we did in another project. Right. And, and right. they're buying into me. But in your scenario, if you have that full-time person, he's passing it off to that team. So yes. do, you, do you approach sales differently than maybe in my scenario? And how do, yeah. yeah. I, th- I think we do. Um, and it, it's evolved since I joined the firm. When, when I started, and again, this was in, uh, in the late, seven, uh, late, late 60s, um, George Helmuth was the marketing genius of HOK. And he, he loved, he was an architect. He was trained as an architect. Started as a designer, uh, but had a natural gift for reaching out and connecting with people. And George Helmuth was, uh, he wanted to have a firm. Let me, let me back up. This is a, a really good story about him. George Helmuth uh, grew up in St. Louis. He's the only one of the founders who did. Um, and graduated from Washington University, which is a good private university in St. Louis with a good architecture program. And graduated in 1930. And for those people who are students of history, 1930 was a terrible time to graduate. Uh, The Great Depression had just begun. He couldn't get a job. He finally got a job working for the city of St. Louis, designing bus stops and, and public toilets. And he did that for six years. And the interesting thing was, his father and his uncle had a firm in St. Louis. Helmuth and Helmuth, and the two brothers, his father and his uncle, were out of work. They couldn't afford to bring in uh, George himself because they didn't have the work. So he was seared by that experience. How in the heck are we going to have a firm if we don't have work? If you don't have work, there's no money coming in the door, there's no client to serve, you're out of business. So, and it's not unlike perhaps today with the coronavirus, Maybe we had clients, but they've probably reached out and said, um, we don't know what we're going to do, but just put, we're going to put your job on hold right. until we figure it out. Uh, or, uh, gee, we're going to have to stop this project because we have our own cash flow problems with clients of ours, and, or maybe we've just lost our job. And so you're out of business or in, until you figure your way through it. But Helmuth was so seared by the Great Depression he, he wanted to invent a new kind of architecture practice, one where instead of having partners that did everything, they, they get the work, they have contacts in the business community that they use, they design the work, and they have a team of draftsmen, or, and now in our case, uh, people that know how to work uh, CAD or BIM programs to help them uh, deliver the work. And Helma said, no, no, we're not going to do that. 
in HOK, we're going to have one partner, one, that's myself, I'm going to be full-time marketing. We're going to have another partner that Gail Obata, who's going to focus ex exclusively on design, and another partner, George Kassebaum, to focus exclusively on production. And uh, that, his, his focus on that was that if you do something every day, you get pretty good at it. Whereas if you do a little of this and a little of that, and whatever is needed, you might be pretty good at things, but your natural, in, your natural talent can't have a chance to be developed fully in anything. You become a jack of all trades, master of none. So HOK from the beginning was set up with this, uh, we, we called it a, a troika, a three-legged three stool, where each partner focused on one thing. And they, again, they were lucky because they had work from the split up with uh, Yamasaki. But uh, Helmuth, in the early days, Helmuth would win clients over uh, almost by himself. Uh, and in those days, if Helmuth gave his word that the people in his firm could design something, the client took the word and, and that was it. Um, about the time I joined, that began to change. Clients for, especially any, any building with complication, hospital, airport, um, j county jail, uh, something like that, the clients would say, well, you know, Mr. Helmuth, you're a nice guy, but who's going to actually work on this and do they have any experience? Right. So uh, uh, that began to change then that, and we, he called that the new marketing where he would unearth the, the client, he would discover the client or the pro prospect for a client and then he would begin to bring the project team with him to meet the client. And the interview was always with the, the people who were actually going to do the work. And uh, uh, so that way, the marketing became, there was still one person, and there is today in every HOK office, and in, uh, there is a one person, 100% devoted to marketing. But they, they are more devoted to getting the client and the HOK team that will do their work together. Yep. Discovering yep. the client and then finding a way to get them together. So the project team has to sell themselves. So as a result, everyone at HOK that rises to the level of project architect, project manager, project designer, um, or specialist of some kind, healthcare specialist, let's say, they all, part of their routine is to meet clients and interview and describe how they approach their work and how they're going to take care of the client's uh, uh, building. So uh, marketing has changed at HOK, except there is still a single-minded focus on marketing and marketing for diversity. Um, when HOK was begun, almost every firm, this is the post-war year, uh, post years, 1955, there were lots of schools to design because there was a baby boom. Mm -hmm. And first it was grade schools and HOK did plenty of those. Helmuth made a decision. He said, George, Casabom and Gio, you guys know how to do schools. You already have school clients that you're working with. I'm gonna focus on anything except schools. I'm gonna go out and pioneer market for any other kind of building types because he could see the end of the school marketplace when the baby boom had finished. And he was right. So he was able to get an airport project. He was able to get the first beginnings of a, of a hospital for HOK. And uh, the first, actually really interesting, he flew all the way from St. Louis to Washington, D.C. repeatedly in the early days of commercial aviation and began to call on the federal bureaucracy and managed to land the Federal Bureau of Prisons um, new penitentiary in uh, Southern Illinois that replaced Alcatraz as the federal penitentiary that was the maximum security without HOK ever having uh, had any uh, prison design experience. He did, you know, he was, he was masterful at that. So he got us started in a building type. Then the people that worked on that prison naturally gained experience and the next prison project, uh, they came along for, for the interview. Yep. So the startup was hard. But now HOK has, across the country and across the world, 
people who are very specialized in all kinds of building types. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you want to have, there's a, we have a person uh, in the healthcare group that is a specialist on operatories for brain surgery. That sounds like a pretty detailed thing, and it is. What's the arrangement of all the equipment in the operatory for doing brain surgery? And it's different than um, delivering babies or, or fixing broken legs. Mm -hmm. So, um, uh, the, uh, and, and so diversity uh, and then gaining expertise in each piece of the, the client, the, each piece of the building type that you're designing ultimately became the focus for marketing. But we I still think, have full-time marketers. I, I think that's a great way to structure it. And you'll probably appreciate this story. Um, just like you said, when you're selling, bring the team that's actually going to do the work. I'm in meetings a lot of the times when we already have the work. And I'm sitting across from maybe the engineer, the structural engineer, or the civil. And every time I'm on a project, I actually bring the guy that's doing the actual work. We're a smaller firm, um, but it, it's very clear. And, and sometimes I'll even say it is, you know, I'm over, I'm doing maybe the, the role of those three people, but the production is, is sitting right next to me. And I just wonder, you know, I'm talking to the engineer. I'm like, you're not doing the work. Why don't you bring the guy that's actually doing the work? Like we're, it, it creates yes. this leg. And for some reason, some of these people want to pretend like they're doing all the work and we know it's not true. There's some 20 year old that, you know, back at the computer that's actually getting things done. Well, that's, that's right. It goes back to what I said before, which is the bosses in the firm, the principals, the partners, whatever you call them, they're actually working for everybody else to keep, to keep everybody else busy and to keep a flow of the work going. So, yes, um, you as the architect, I think, should insist that the people who are actually doing the work for your, uh, that are your, and your consultants, your engineering consultants, uh, whatever, the people who are doing the work are the ones that should be at the table. Um, that's, that's how you're going to actually solve the design and the coordination problems and what have you. Do you see um, any other kind of flaws in the way um, architecture is traditionally practiced? Um, I see plenty. <laughs> yes, I see plenty. Um, I mean, uh, when I was in school, um, I, architecture to me was the pinnacle of the professions. Uh, it ranked above doctors and lawyers and, um, and uh, accountants and other professionals because it was a creative uh, professional who was dedicated to creating a better environment for people to live and work and play and, and so on. And uh, what I found, the cold reality of it is, and I think everybody that's listening knows this, is that architects have been pushed to the side too often Mm -hmm. And uh, people even wonder, well, why do I have to have a, can't I just hire a contractor and have them build my building? Uh, I live in California and uh, remember how HOK and everybody else was doing schools with, during the baby boom. Well, in California, even though there's been a lot of population growth, most of the classroom buildings that are built in California are not built at all. they are mobile classrooms that are made in a factory and they're shipped to the schoolyard and uh, set up. And uh, so they're a manufactured building and they, they're basically plywood boxes. They look like hell, mm -hmm. but they meet code. They have a guaranteed price uh, and they can, be, they can be leased or bought. The, the, the manufacturer will arrange financing, et cetera. So it's, it's a, compared to stick building, a classroom building, with an architect and a contractor and all that school district just say, you know what, this is easier. It may not be the most beautiful building, but I got it at a good price. And if I need it by next Tuesday, I can have it. Yep. So we have as a profession allowed ourselves to get squeezed to the sidelines. And that, that actually uh, consumes a lot of my waking hours. Uh, part of the reason for writing the book is to get architects, to think clearly about our role in society and regain the position that we once had. Uh, not because it's the law that you have to have a designer design your building, but because it makes good sense, because design counts for something. And that's so often not true. 
if if you I'm on my I'm on my soapbox now, so please forgive me, but if you go up uh, in the sky above any city, say Denver, because you're close there, there are some architect design buildings in the center of town, probably some office buildings and whatnot. Uh, there are some architect designed schools and universities here and there. Uh, the airport I know is designed by an architect, but a lot of the rest of the city, the 7-Eleven store and the housing developments and the this and that are primarily just cookie cutter um, boxes that are built and repeated again and again, not because they're beautifully designed, but because it's an easier path to actually getting something done. And until architects, engineers, and contractors figure out how to compete with that, the world is going to be, I think, a less well-designed and an uglier place. That's the big challenge. That's why I wrote the book. That's why I also, 25 years ago, um, was, a, was a founder of a, a nonprofit called Building Smart, which establishes digital standards, open digital standards, so architects, engineers, and contractors, and owners can exchange better data together and have a smooth, smoother workflows. Um, because our profession is continuing to be squeezed. Instead of being the, the shaper of the uh, environments, uh, we're around the edges. When people think about architecture today, you ask people what they think, they think about the few little buildings like museums of modern art and a few other buildings that are designed by black cape architects, that that's what architecture is. But designing something simple, like a really good house or a really good apartment house or a really good school that is a gracious place for children to be uh, an inspirational place, that's all gotten lost. So yes, we have a hell of a dilemma. And every time we have a financial uh, or other crisis like this one, it makes it that much harder to climb back up to our previous level. So I think we, I think as a profession, we have huge challenges. Patrick, so, um, you, you don't have a hard out anytime soon. Not that I want to go on forever, but I want to make sure, do you have something coming up in the next 10 minutes because it's coming on the top of the hour? No, I don't. I'm good. Okay. okay. Um, because there's one question at the end I want to make sure to get to, but I want to stay on this, this path. How do you, how, how do you start to sell the, the value of architecture and getting back to that area? Because, and then I'll lay out, there's at least two different paths. And, and one is those manufacturing solutions, they come with less regulatory hurdles. And I don't mean in how many boxes they have to check because they probably have to do that too, but it's a quicker, you've probably been at the architecture firm long enough to know a site plan review process is going to take forever going through that city bureaucracy. So right. that's one disadvantage that we have, but we can't always just say, Hey, we have this disadvantage, but we'll produce something better. How do you start to um, change the dialogue mm -hmm. and, and really get us back to that pretty picture that you painted? Well, of course. Yeah. I, I think a picture I painted was not very pretty. Actually, it was pretty grim. Um, how do you get back to that? It's something I've devoted a fair amount of my life to. Uh, uh, and I, I'll give you some hints because I think the younger people are going to have to pick up this baton and figure this out. Mm -hmm. But we, we are practicing architecture almost as a craft movement where you hire a designer, the designer designs a building, whether it's a house or a big building, and then you hire a contractor. And often it's a low bid process for the contractor and the contractor builds it. And there's usually a level of conflict between the architect and the contractor. Uh, and then you finally get a finished building. And uh, contrast that with other things that we take for granted in our lives. Automobile. Um, automobiles are made, they're, they're designed and they're made, but they're manufactured and the design and the manufacturing are integral. They're, they're integrated typically within big companies like Ford or Toyota or General Motors or someone else. Or Tesla is a great new example. Tesla is a, a shining example actually of 
an integrated design process. And you, you have to say, Tesla's got not only a fantastic uh, uh, technology, but a beautiful car. And people are, people are buying Teslas uh, and they're also bidding up the price of Tesla stock. So uh, I think, uh, here, here's another example. You could drive in that Tesla 60 miles an hour with uh, beating the rain beating down on you. And you, you can be in short sleeve comfort because the car is tight, the windows don't leak, the heater and the air conditioning work, and you can listen to a, a fantastic high, uh, high quality stereo music as you're driving. If you subject one of our buildings, either from the most modest house to the biggest building, to 60 mile an hour winds and, uh, and driving rain, something's gonna leak. So our buildings are not as well put together as manufactured products. Uh, aircraft, to fly in a Boeing uh, aircraft, you can fly at 600 miles an hour. It could be minus 70 outside and plus 70 inside, and you're not cold. And the, the wind is going by on the outside of that aircraft at 600 miles an hour, but your hair doesn't get messed up on the inside because it's tight. So I think what we need to do is think about our process differently, that we are part of a process of designing and then manufacturing something. And I would argue that contractors don't construct, they assemble. I think of uh, construction sites, maybe for stick built housing, but most construction sites, the contractor sets up and once they're out of the mud, I agree that there's some construction to, to, to foundations and whatnot. But then the contractor is like an assembler. Trucks come in to the site bringing manufactured products to be assembled and hooked onto the building at the appropriate uh, time. So that the building, the finished building is a collection of mostly manufactured products assembled by the contractor and the subs. And the more efficient we can make that process where we're assembling bigger and bigger components of buildings, the higher quality we can achieve, and the, the more we can then, as thoughtful, creative architects, begin to insert good design thinking into that process. So to me, we have to start thinking that way and working toward that. Our contractors, how many times have you heard at AIA meetings or just around the coffee pot how the contractor is the enemy? Contractor doesn't care about design. They only care about price and schedule. Well, guess what? Our contractors are partner in a process and we have to figure this out with them. And they're, they're good people in contracting, just like there are in architecture and engineering. They are our partners, but we've treated each other at arm's length because of the system that we have inherited from, um, gosh, before my time where architects and contractors are separate. So I'm a building owner and I have two contracts, one with my architect and then one with my engineer. That's a, that's a ready made, that's ready made for, for a conflict. But if I'm a, if instead of being a building owner, if I'm a car buyer, I buy a car that where the design and the manufacturing are all integral and they're guaranteed by one company. We can't guarantee anything because it violates the covenants of our insurance. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to get to the point where, like manufacturers, we can say, yes, this building is designed to withstand uh, 100 mile an hour winds, or it's designed to, be, to be, uh, have a certain parameter for heating and cooling, where it's super green, not just a little bit green. And I think we have to think of ourselves in a, it's, it's not a revolutionary way, just look at the world of manufacturing. It's all around us, where we simply take for granted the next smartphone we have is going to be better than the last one, better processors, faster, better cameras, what have you. Well, meantime, our buildings don't seem to be getting that much better. And I think that's our great challenge. We have to think about it differently. And you will not find it, I don't believe, at your local AIA meeting. I think you'll find it looking elsewhere, which is why I got involved in Building Smart, which is architects, engineers, contractors, building owners, regulators, building code people. And now um, the 
we've been in business now, or again, this is a nonprofit international, 22 countries are joined with us. We've got meetings all over the world, even now virtual meetings. And now the big infrastructure companies have come in. People that are, that are designing and building and operating railroads, seaports, airports, and uh, electric grids uh, saying, you know, we need to do this too. We need to have better systematic thinking about how we exchange information so we do a better job. I live in California where Pacific Gas and Electric, PG&E, has failed consistently to provide good, safe electricity. They need to be in my group figuring out how to, how to do a smart grid. So right. uh, I am on a soapbox, but we've got to think totally differently about this. It's not just tweaking the differences a little bit. And we as architects, um, you may not want to hear this, we can't solve this by ourselves. We need lots of partners, uh, people that we deal with in our industry, contractors, subs, and major, uh, uh, all the suppliers of parts and pieces for buildings, the, the manufacturers. I, I agree. And I think that the, the soapbox that you kind of said is the challenge of our time is how to put all those pieces together to make it yes. work in, in a better way. And, but let's kind of go away from that and come back to some firms are just struggling to survive right now. So yes. while I do yeah. believe that that is the challenge of our time, people are thinking about how do I just survive this recession? So what are some ways to maybe diversify or recession proof your firm? Yes. Okay. That's an excellent question because it'd be, it's wonderful to think about this intergalactic, how do we transform our industry? But meanwhile, how do I get paid tomorrow? How do I keep my firm? Yep. And I don't mean to demean the first part. I, I just want to balance the um, conversation. They're both important, but uh, eating, eating every day, keeping your firm intact today allows you to have a firm tomorrow and fight the good fight mm -hmm. to transform our industry tomorrow. So yes, to today. Um, this thing has been going on now for a month, six weeks. Um, if we had had this conversation a month or six weeks ago, I would have said, and I will still say, if you're, if you have your own practice, whether it's one person or 10 or a hundred, the first thing you do when you see that this is happening is you don't wait for your clients to call you and say, or send you an email and say, stop work. You call, you reach out to every single client by phone or by um, Zoom or some other uh, system and say, how are you faring in these times? How's your family? Is everybody okay? Are you safe? How's your business? How can we help you through this? Stay engaged with your clients because without your clients, you're out of business. And then they'll say, well, actually my boss at the big company that I work for told me that we had to stop working on this project and say, well, you know, maybe that's a good idea, but could I suggest that we're right in the middle of design development and the, the smart thing to do would be to finish the phase so that we're at a good stopping point, good pause point uh, where we can actually document everything that we've done uh, in the way of designing and organizing this building uh, instead of stopping at mid phase, because when you do return to start up again, there will be additional work and uh, we'll have lost some, some thread of where we were. And so you, you, you do everything you can to persuade your clients to stick with you and extend a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you're, if you have a project under construction, chances are there's still construction work going on. Uh, or if not, uh, well, if there are places where construction has been stopped, but uh, this will not, you know, think about it this way. This will not last forever. We've been in it a month or six weeks, and it seems like forever, but it's not. You might need to last it. You might need your firm to last two months, three months, four months before things start to loosen up. How do you do that? Well, first, you, you, con you connect to every client, not just once, but every week. How can we help you? Maybe the client is consolidating. Uh, they've laid off a bunch of people and they all want to be in one building now. Okay, may I help you with your, your interior fit out for that one building so that you're all consolidated in some good team? Uh, you, uh, maybe instead of starting design on that new building, maybe we could do some programming 
to help you to help us refine what the design criteria will be. Um, you look for every opportunity to serve that client. Clients come first. Uh, the second thing I do, and I don't, when I say second, I don't mean to put my employees second, but uh, I talk to every single one of my employees. If it's a small firm, you do that directly. Or if you're all, if you're all uh, sequestered as I am in California, you do it with Zoom or some other way and you tell them exactly what's going on. Tell them the truth. We have, um, we have uh, lost one client X and client Y has given us a short time duration to finish up a phase and client Z has, has said they'll think about it and get back to us. Meanwhile, we've got six people, 10 people, 20 people on the payroll. How do we keep going? So if you're the owner, you have to figure that out. Here's my little rule of thumb. If your payroll, what you pay people, somebody, if you're paying somebody, let's use a nice round number, $100,000 a year, mm-hmm. and you think this is going to last three months, you're going to pay a third of 100000 plus fringes to that person, and they may not work for those three months, or they may work only a little part-time. Do you have any cash? Can you get a loan? Before you pull the trigger and say, you know, I just can't use you anymore. I'm sorry. Hang on to your good people because they are your lifeblood when you're back on track. Uh, If you do your math, you find that you can make it through three months, but you're going to be short on cash. Maybe you suggest to your employees in a group meeting, group Zoom meeting or something or a WebEx or whatever, uh, look, uh, I think there's a way for us to get through this. If we all take, starting with me, the, the principal or the partner, we, if we all take a 75% uh, or 25%, let's say, pay cut. You know, we're all sequestered at home, so all the little things that we used to do, we can't do anyway. So if we get through that and we all take that, that pay cut, I think we can keep all of us on, on staff together intact for 90 days. And let's let's get, and I'll give you weekly updates if you all agree. And then after this is over, we've still got a long way to go before the year is out. Let's all work together and work like crazy to restore our firm's health, financial health, so that we can restore that lost pay back. And I, I commit to you that every single one of you will have his or her pay restored before I get mine because uh, we have a shared risk. So you share your risk. You communicate clearly with your people and you do some really good math and figure out how long you can live uh, on the money that you have or the money that you expect to come in. Um, Keep that firm intact and remember it's not going to be forever. It might be next month. It might be the month after next, but things will start up again and don't just give up the ghost on your firm. Do everything you can do to keep it going. Great. Great. Um, I, I appreciate that. Uh, I think that's great advice. Um, as we wrap up, anything you want to leave, uh, leave people with, uh, how to contact you, anything like that. I will say that um, I did uh, peruse through your book. I just got it on Friday and over the weekend I looked over it. And I must say that the chapters and the few things that I read are, I, I want to say, time, well, of course, are time tested. You've been doing this for a while. <laughs> they <50 are>. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as a firm owner, just the way that you explained some things and simplified it, the book is going to be worth it. It's called Designing a World-Class Architecture Firm. I don't know if you could get a better source than a firm like HOK to really give you these, these practical insights, um, but I'll, I'll leave the last words to you. Okay. Well, thank you, Alex. Um, yes, of course, uh, I wrote the book. You know, not for myself. Well, I wrote it to get the ideas out of my head and down on paper or digital form because uh, I have this passion about our, our profession and this passion about how do, we, how do we get better at this and how do we get back into the central place in our society that I think we need to be. The book contains it uh, at every chapter. There are 29 chapters. It contains lessons learned that I have learned in my exactly 50 year career at HOK, all the way from how you become a leader to how you manage the finances. 
Um, I went through uh, a number of recessions and crises, including 9-11, the 08 meltdown, and so on, as, um, as a leader in HOK. So you could say that HOK and I are time-tested. And I'm very open and frank with what I had to do to make things work uh, and to get through these uh, crises. This coronavirus crisis is not that much different than something else, than, than a financial crisis or 9-11. It, it's not us on our backsides, but we just have to get organized so that we come out on the sunny side up. The book has lessons for people. If you, uh, of course, I'd be delighted if you bought the book. Uh, I'd also be delighted if anyone wanted to reach out to me uh, directly. And uh, Alex, you could post my email if you wish. Will do. Uh, and I also have a little website that's mostly about uh, allowing people to see who I am and a little bit more about the book. And that's maclamey.com. So you could post that if you wish. Uh, but I'm here to, uh, I haven't really retired. I'm repurposed. My, my goal is to get us back where we should be, all of us and uh, have our societies benefit from really great design. I think that's a perfect way to end. So thank you for your time, and, and we appreciate it, Patrick. Okay, Alex, and again, thank you for having me on. I've enjoyed it. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, don't forget to leave us a five-star review on the iTunes app. Tip your barista, and we'll see you next week for more Monday Morning Coffee with Inside the Firm.